we're kicking off today's webinar, we've got two exciting speakers. We have Mr. Darshan Gandhi. Now, Darshan is a primary care clinical pharmacist based in Southwest London. He has over 15 years of experience in the community pharmacy areas, as well as hospital sectors. He has also won several awards, including the Day Lewis Pharmacist of the Year back in 2012. Darshan is also a CPPE tutor for pharmacy postgraduate and pre-reg students. He is also a Morph Associate for London, and he was also nominated for the finalist in 2013 for the Chemist and Druggist, Druggist Manager of the Year. Darshan will, will be the first speaker for tonight's talk. Our second speaker will be Ms. Sharmina Khan. Now, Ms. Sharmina Khan is a cataract and lens specialist with over 18 years of experience at the world renowned Moorfields Eye Hospital and Moorfields Private Eye Hospital. Ms. Khan is also the cataract and audit service lead since 2016. And she has also conducted over 4,000 cataract operations in the previous five years, which is above the national average. She has also got a cataract and cornea fellowship, which is her advanced subspeciality training. And she is also the lead, the module lead for the cataract and refractive surgery on the UCL MSc in ophthalmology. We anticipate the webinar to run for approximately just over an hour. And again, if anyone has any questions, please write them in the chat box of Zoom and we will get these answered for you and follow up by email. So without further ado, we're going to kick the webinar off and start with Mr. Darshan Gandhi. Hello, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar on dry eyes. My name is Darshan Gandhi, and I'm a primary care network clinical pharmacist based in Southwest London. So here are my disclosures. I do provide education training to undergraduate MPharm students, as well as postgraduate pharmacists on various clinical topics. Mostly all are funded through the NHS or Health Education England, but occasionally I do provide training and education through companies whereby I receive honorarium, such as the delivery for this presentation. So we're going to be uh, kicking off this presentation. I'm going to be keeping my camera off now to enable a better bandwidth and less time lag for you, the uh, learners today. Um, I'm going to be assuming a certain level of knowledge from my learners of dry eye syndrome, dry eye disease uh, in my presentation. And I'll be kicking off with the discussion about the etiology, pathophysiology, management, preparations, and techniques with self-management for dry eye sufferers. We'll also be looking at comparing the viscosity using the drop test for visual representation near the end. Now, tears are comprised of a complex mixture of water, salt, lipids, proteins, and mucins. The lacrimal glands, which are the uh, almond-shaped exocrine glands located uh, in the upper lateral region of each eye orbit, produces the aqueous component, such as the water, salts, and proteins. The malobian glands, located here, um, produce the lipid and the conjunctival goblet cells produce the mucins. A steady basal flow maintains the tear film that protects the eye. So what is dry eyes? Well, dry eyes are defined as a multifactorial disease of the tears and ocular surface that results in symptoms of discomfort, visual disturbances, and tear film instability with the potential damage to the ocular surface. Dry eyes can arise as a result of insufficient tear production, excess tear loss, abnormalities of the eyelid and blinking, or changes in tear film composition. Different forms of dry eyes interact with each other, creating a vicious cycle, and the inflammation both is caused as a consequence and a cause of dry eyes and can have a key role in maintaining the vicious cycle. So many of us in primary care are likely to encounter patients with uh, dry eye conditions. And there may be individuals with dry eye conditions who have no measurable abnormalities in their tear production and no serious diseases affecting their tear composition. The main two reasons why individuals may come in could be as a result of two uh, purposes. One, the decreased tear production, 
which could be as a result of an infection, blepharitis, uh, in a form of subhoronic dermatitis or atopic dermatitis or even rosacea. Individuals who may be on polypharmacy could be impacted by having the address adverse effects of drugs, uh, such as in the use of antihistamines, nasal decongestions, hormone therapies, such as in that of HRT and contraceptives, certain blood pressure medication, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and Parkinson medication as well. The other aspect of uh, cause to dry eyes could be the increased evaporation of tears. And this is mainly due to environmental factors, such as having low humidity, in the event of winter, people could be having their central heatings uh, boosted up in all their rooms, or in summer, their conditioning could be in full blast. Also, outside could have um, high wind conditions, increasing the risk of evaporation. Individuals could also have a low blink rate uh, from activities such as prolonged use of computers or microscopes. Both the causes of disease, decreased uh, tear production and increased evaporation of tears can be uh, as a result of allergic conjunctivitis, a contributor of both. Now, there are a number of contributing factors that increase the risk of individuals developing dry eyes. Um, women are disproportionately affected by, eye, by dry eyes, and uh, these are diagnosed at a younger age. Dry eyes are associated with a wide range of comorbidities where there is a strong association with an autoimmune disorder, especially those that affect women more so than men. There is also an increased risk of developing the issue due to hormonal changes. Uh, these hormonal fluctuations, especially of estrogen during pregnancy and menopause, can also lead on to having a high prevalence of dry eyes in individuals. Dry eyes are also more common in older people. Roughly between a third of patients aged over 65 uh, seem to have contracted this uh, and is mainly due to the deterioration of tear production and as a side effect associated with polypharmacy, as mentioned earlier. We mentioned about environmental causes, uh, which increase the risk of getting dry eyes, and these include dry environments or prolonged exposure to visual display units, computers, uh, thereby reducing blink rate. When wearing contact lenses, your eyes do dry out anyway. Uh, slightly different to dry eye syndrome, uh, contact lens induced dry eyes, CLIDE, Clyde, occurs because the thin layer of the contact lens material on your cornea limits the oxygen flow to the eyes. Without a steady flow of oxygen, your eyes struggle to develop tears, natural tears. Evidence for benefit of nutritional supplements uh, and the research around this basically has found that omega-3 supplements do impart a neuroprotective effect in the cornea, which correlates with improvement in tear osmolarity. Best foods for such omega-3 fatty acids tend to be cold water fish, which are high in both DHA and EPA. Examples of this include things like sardines, herring, salmon, uh, and tuna. But if you aren't a fish lover, another way to make sure that your diet contains enough omega-3 fatty acids uh, is to take fish oil supplements. And these are also available in capsules, liquids, uh, uh, forms, and, and many have a variety of a non-fishy taste. Other good sources of omega-3 fatty acids include things like flax seeds, flaxseed oil, walnuts, and dark green leafy vegetables. However, your body cannot process omega-3 fatty acids from these vegetarian sources as easily as the DHA and EPA omega-3 fatty acids found in fish. It's also important as a when imparting information to patients about their dry eyes, is to ensure that they are reducing their intake of omega-6 fatty acids uh, by avoiding things which are like fried and highly processed foods. Many cooking oils, including sunflower oil and corn oil, are very high in omega-6 fatty acids. 
high cooking temperatures also creates harmful uh, trans fats, uh, which obviously is uh, detrimental to an individual's overall health. Vitamin A or retinoid deficiency and chemical burns are also uh, contributing factors to increased evaporation loss. And preservatives found in artificial tails, specifically looking at benzocolonium chloride, can also contribute towards the problem as well. So what causes dry eyes? Well, the tear film is made up of three layers, or four if you're including the microvilli of the corneal epithelium. The problems in different layers are associated with different types of dry eye. So let's have a look at the different layers. Layer one is the mucin inner layer, which sits on the epithelial surface of the eye, and it consists of a sponge-like meshwork of fluid and glycoprotein molecules produced by the goblet cells. Damage to any part of this system can affect tear stability and lead on to dry eyes. The second layer is the aqueous middle layer. It's comprised of almost 98% water and is produced by the lacrimal glands and also contains immunoglobulins, electrolytes, and epithelial growth factors. Now, deterioration of the aqueous middle layer is classified uh, into Sjogren's syndrome related, which is an autoimmune disorder, or non Sjogren's syndrome related, which includes issues caused by systemic medication. The final layer, layer three, is the outer lipid layer and is produced by the myobian gland, uh, which reduces the evaporation. Problems with this layer can lead to evaporative dry eye and is most often due to the myobian gland dysfunction. However, uh, other causes also include allergy, topical medication, which includes the use of preservatives in eye drops and contact lens wear. The main symptoms of dry eye uh, present as intermittent blurred vision and a dry, gritty sensation in the eye. Additional symptoms can include burning or itching in the eyes, excessive tearing, pain, redness, and in some instances, a stringy discharge. Most cases are mild, but occasionally, in severe cases, it can cause corneal ulceration and loss of sight. So let's get back to our patient. When we're taking an effective history, it's important to keep the patient at the center of your consultations. And as part of your patient-centered care, it's important to elicit relevant and pertinent information relating to the patient and how they are feeling and what they're experiencing. Patients may report discomforting, watering eyes, dis visual disturbances, and light sensitivity a really useful tool to make subjective quali qu qualitative data into a quantitative representation is using the Ocular Surface Disease Index. Now this is a validated questionnaire that correlates moderately well with disease severity. Each item is graded from zero to four and a score of uh, equal to greater than 30 indicates severe dry eye disease. We would also need to look at uh, other underlying conditions associated with dry eyes, such as allergic conjunctivitis, blepharitis, Schrodinger's syndrome, and eyelid abnormalities. Currently, there are no UK national guidance for the treatment of dry eyes. So reference to any local guidance is important. But remember, guidelines are just that. They're there to assist and guide. Guidelines are not train tracks. They are more like handrails. So to ensure that we have a patient-centered approach when considering what optimal interventions can be done to make sure that the patient's life is optimal and better. So the NICE guidelines, uh, CKS uh, recommends the following. Review treatments already tried and the response to these. Consider if preservatives in topical eye medications may be a cause. Review medication that may cause or exacerbate dry eyes, such as the use of antihistamines, beta blockers, estrogen therapy, uh, antidepressants, uh, isotretinoin. 
identify any underlying conditions associated with dry eyes, such as Stroger syndrome or previous ocular or eyelid surgery. And finally, make any changes to the environment where possible. So increasing humidity, the impact of computer use. For patients who require ocular lubricants, there are a num numerous choices on the market as seen here on the chart. The majority of prescribing is for hypermellows and hyaluronic acid. And finding a suitable product for a patient involves taking a detailed history of what products they have tried and how long for. It is important that patients are involved in this decision-making process uh, for their treatment in order to achieve good adherence and to gain maximum benefit for the patient. As mentioned earlier, many local NHS authorities have produced their own prescribing guidelines. But it's important to consider the ease of use when deciding on multi-dose bottles or single-dose units. The overall cost of treatment will also depend on the frequency of use, the expiry date once the product is opened, and patient preference. It is also important to note that many lubricating drops are classified as medical devices and as such are subject to different regulatory processes from licensed medications. Now let's extrapolate this information back to our practices in primary care and look at the individuals who are presenting to us in our clinics. So here is some local guidelines which I obtained from a local CCG, uh, which clearly shows that a, a, a f first line, second line, third line approach, which they are suggesting to the clinicians when deciding what treatments individuals should be, should be provided for and what subsequent uh, in, um, treatment they should go on to, uh, depending on how they are progressing. So hypermellos tends to be usually the main first line option for most uh, healthcare authorities in the UK. Um, but carbamol and liquid paraffin are also part of that in, in for, for me locally. Second line options tends to be carmelos, uh, and this is quite comparable to a lot of the health, uh, health authorities and CCGs in the area. And obviously third line options would contain the various percentages of sodium hyaluronate preparations that are available. So. As I mentioned before, guidelines are not train tracks, they're merely handrails to ensure that we are using that information when we're not st uh, stuck to that process. So we have to take a patient-centered approach when considering what is the most optimal intervention for this patient. Okay, what will give them the best benefit uh, in treatment so that they can keep it up and get the best outcome. So I think this was exemplified by a search I conducted uh, for one of my local surgeries where I, I found 356 patients who were on current therapies for dry eye lubricants and were, and were diagnosed as having dry eye disease. Of these individuals, 57%, that's 204 of these 356 patients were prescribed as initial therapy, the first and second line. So not necessarily going in the order of first, second and third line, but their initial therapy was either the first or the second line options available to, to them. And 43% were prescribed as the initial therapy, the third line options of sodium hyaluronate. But more interestingly, I found was actually that subsequent to being initiated with either the first or second line options, the 204 patients, 47% of those patients, that's 96 individuals, had to be escalated to be given the third line options uh, of sodium hyaluronate because of failure of the first two uh, lubricants, first two option lubricants. And what that really suggests that it's important as clinicians to be acknowledging local guidelines, 
but using them as guidances, as not the law, and looking at the patient specifically in terms of what their aims and objectives are in order what they want to achieve. So really keeping them at the center of this decision-making process. So let's look at this in a bit more depth. Why was sodium hyaluronate, although being a third line option, was prescribed as the initial therapy for those number of patients? Or indeed, why was it considered to be the next step after failure of the first and second line options from the previous slide? Well, in order to answer this, we have to look at the characteristics and properties of sodium hyaluronate and why it ticks the boxes of patients in their preference towards the aim that they're trying to achieve. So let's start looking at the characteristics of sodium hyaluronate. Sodium hyaluronate is a viscoelastic agent that lubricates as well as protects the ocular surface and has a significantly longer ocular residence time than hydropropyl methylcellulose, which is HPMC. It is found in the vitreous and the aqueous humor in the eye, and its concentration increases in response to ocular damage and during corneal wound healing. Therefore, it may play a part in controlling the localized inflammation. It mimics the tear film, i.e. it shows non-Newtonian properties. And this is exemplified by polymer solutions, which we'll be talking about in the next slide. Sodium hyaluronate is a naturally occurring polymer and is ubiquitous throughout the interstitial cellular spaces in humans. It helps retain moisture in different types of tissue throughout the human body and aids lubrication between the layers of tissue to eliminate friction, thus making it an ideal physiological tear film substitute. So let's look a little bit deeper into the properties of sodium hyaluronate and as a result, its viscosity. In simple terms, viscosity is defined as the fluid's resistance to flow. For sodium hyaluronate, it is driven by two factors, one, the molecular weight, and two, the percentage concentration. So in other words, high molecular weight results in longer coil structures with large hydrophilic domains. Sodium hyaluronate attracts and retains large amounts of water effectively, thus increasing the stability of the preconeural tear film, prolonging the beneficial wetting effect over time. As we mentioned earlier, there's a wide selection of sodium hyaluronate containing preparations on the market, but here are just a few for comparison. It's important to note that there are differences in molecular weight for all these products, despite having the same concentration of sodium hyaluronate. So it's not a true like-for-like -like comparison. Residence time, blink resistance, and film forming are key quality attributes of eye drops, determined in no small part by the rheology. Rheology is a branch of physics that deals with non-Newtonian flow of liquid. And these properties are compared when considering patient preference and thus maximizing patient adherence to the treatment. Now, I'm not going to delve too much into this today, but there are two properties as key contributors to the functionality of non-Newtonian flow. First one is zero shear viscosity, which in simple terms is the stickiness property of a polymer thickened eye drop formulation. A high zero shear viscosity has been shown to adhere longer to the ocular surface, a measure known as residence time. The higher the value, the longer the residence time of a lubricant on the eye surface. The second property is viscosity at blink shear rates. Now, the shear rates present in the tear film during the process of blinking. An eye drop viscosity approaching that of normal tears helps prevent the patient in experiencing blurring and noticeable discomfort uh, during blinking. This is an example found in liquid paraffin ion based preparations. 
if we look at the biological equivalents and sterility, the high-low range is usable for up to six months, and the other products here can be used for up to three months. The longer date with high-low reduces waste and carbon footprint, and it gives patients longer period for use if their dry eye condition is varying, such as only happens when they're used in front of a computer or if they're in a room where the AC is on or if it's windy weather outside. The drops from the unique commode bottle can be administered at any angle, whereas the traditional eye drops work on a gravity feed, again, enabling patients the ease of use. Now we spoke earlier about how preservatives can interrupt the tear film and uh, the article here presented today uh, also exemplifies this in terms of why preservative free eye drop products are seen as beneficial in the used to introduction. And it simply states that a preservative free eye drops have shown greater effectiveness than preserved eye drops in decreasing inflammation on the ocular surface and increasing the antioxidant content in tears of patients with dry eye disease. So why use preservative free eye drops? Well, apart from the article, regarding using preservative free. The evidence is mounting that preservatives are used to avoid bacterial contamination, but these themselves can cause issues in some patients. The ocular surface inflammation associated with dry eye syndrome is exacerbated by preserved lubricants. And if the patient has more than one eye condition for which they are using eye treatments, their potential to exposure to preservatives is vastly increased. The re repeat use of preservatives contained in eye drops, such as benzocolonium chloride, as seen in the picture here, can be associated with ocular allergies and toxicity. If patients develop sensitivities to preservatives, and this is confirmed, it is ideal to document this, as any other future product that they would have to use should not contain preservatives. So let's go back to our patient population and individuals who might come into your practice in primary care with dry eye syndrome. Who would be appropriate for preservative free eye drops? Well, any individual who has a true preservative allergy would be a candidate. We'd also would need to ensure that individuals coming to our practices, if there's any evidence of epithelial toxicity from preservatives as well, would need to be documented and considered for preservative free. Anyone that you have diagnosed or have a, um, a potential of having severe dry eye syndrome with ocular surface disease and impairment of their lacrimal gland secretion would need to also be considered. And remember, this is uh, identified through using the ocular surface disease index tool we mentioned earlier in our presentation. Individuals who have chronic eye disease or on multiple preserved topical medication would need to be considered, in fact, would need to be monitored for any sort of adverse uh, reactions from preservatives. And of course, those individuals who are wearing soft or hybrid contact lenses would benefit from using preservative free eye drops. So a little bit more about phosphates contained within eye drops. Phosphates are widely used in eye drops and can also have harmful effect uh, to an already damaged cornea. The binding of phosphate to calcium, which is released from damaged corneal cells, may lead to the formation of sparingly soluble calcifications that can permanently impair vision. As you can see from our diagram above, the deposits of calcium phosphate precipitation uh, causes the abrased cornea after an hourly treatment of phosphate buffered eye drops over a duration of three days. And the use of any sort of phosphate free eye drops prevents this 
calcium phosphate precipitation to allow a smooth and clear corneal uh, even after hourly treatment with a eye drop over duration of three days. So for patients, the activities of daily living and the impact of dry eyes can be very debilitating, especially at the more serious end of the spectrum. Adding in dexterity issues, poor grip, arthritis, and frailty, there are numerous factors to consider for each patient when choosing a compliance aid that can support them with their self-care and ensure their independence. Instilling eye drops can require the assistance of a partner impacting on that individual's dependence. And we might also be assuming that there is a partner available to assist with this. The recent pandemic has highlighted that the number of patients living on their own who are perhaps reliant on carers or district nursing team to visit them for a few times a day to instill medication, such as for eye drops and administer insulin. Using a compliance aid such as Comply for the higher range can support patients with their self-care and reducing the need for carers and district nurses and give them the independence they deserve. The Know Your Drops campaign was launched in August 2016 by Moorfields Eye Hospital NHS Trust. After a, patient's, after a patient needed some extra support with putting in the eye drops, we reflected after whether we could improve our service with respect to helping patients and carers with their eye drop technique and compliance to ensure that we deliver the best possible help and support to these individuals. The Know Your Drop resources are also available on the Moorefields website. Please see moorefields.nhs.uk forward slash know your drops for further information. They are also on Twitter and Facebook. Hi, my name's Sarah Thomas and I'm one of the pharmacists running the hashtag Know Your Drops pharmacy campaign. Today I'm going to show you the Comply, which is a gadget designed for the Hilo range of multi-dose eye drops to help with stable positioning over the eye and to make it easier for you to squeeze the bottles. Here's how to use the Comply. After washing your hands, place the multi-dose bottle into the cradle with the nozzle pointing towards the eyepiece. Remove the lid from the eye drop bottle. Then, when you're ready, sit or lie comfortably and tilt your head back. Then, with the viewing hole facing upwards, use the aid to pull down your lower eyelid, or you can use your fingers if you prefer. By doing this, you create a pocket for the eye drop to land into, to get better absorption into the eye. The lower part of the comply should be resting now onto your cheekbone, and the top part of the comply should be resting on your eyebrow bone. When in position, place your thumbs either side of the eyepiece. Look up through the viewing hole and then use your fingers to press and release one drop into your eye. The drop should land directly into the middle of your eye into the pocket. Unless advised otherwise by your clinician, once you put your drop in, close your eye and use one finger to gently press the inner corner of your eye for 30 seconds. This will help prevent the eye drop from running down into your mouth and ensures that as much as possible of the drop is absorbed into your eye to help with your treatment. If it's your first time using Hilo, you'll notice that the bottle looks different from other eyedrop bottles. Here's a brief tutorial on how to use it. Your eyes are dry and you want to apply a drop of Hilo. Before you can take the bottle out of the box, you will need to break the safety seal on the box. To do this, simply press down on the top with your thumb. Now that you have the Hilo bottle in your hand, start by removing the overcap. If your fingers slip, you can put a band-aid or elastic band around the overcap to make it easier. Turn the bottle over so the dropper tip points down. Only if it's your first time using the bottle, you'll need to prime the system. You'll do this by placing your middle and index finger on the base and your thumb on the shoulder of the bottle. 
press and release the base quickly and firmly several times until the first drop comes out. Now, the bottle of Hilo is ready for use. To apply a drop, lean your head back and gently pull your lower lid down with one hand. Use this hand to support the hand holding the bottle. For some, it helps to lie down or sit in a chair. Feel free to do so. Press firmly and quickly on the base of the bottle. Make sure that there's no contact between the tip of the bottle and your eye or your skin. Close your eye gently, try not to squeeze your eyelids, so the drop can spread evenly over the eye surface. Make sure that the dropper tip is dry before replacing the overcap. If a drop lingers on the tip, simply shake it off. The Hilo airless pump system ensures that no contaminated air flows back into the bottle. Preservatives are no longer required, yet the bottle can be used for six months once primed. One push releases only one precisely dosed drop. So we'll be comparing the various eye drops that are out on the market uh, by conducting a drop test on an eye black screen, which shows the viscosity and the properties of these eye drops uh, when considering for patients who may have eye, uh, dry eye syndrome. The first one will be Theozole Duo. Theozole Duo contains um, sodium hyaluronate 0.15% and Trilohose 3.3%. Yeah. The next one we'll be trying will be Hyaback 0.15%, which contains uh, sodium hyaluronate 0.15%. The third one will be Hydromed, which contains sodium hyaluronate 0.2% and a TS polysaccharide 0.2%. The fourth one will be Evolve HA, which contains sodium hyaluronate 0.2%. And finally, we'll be using the Hydro Forte, which contains sodium hyaluronate 0.2%. So it shows the difference in viscosity and how long it drops down the screen surface comparable to each other. And from that, we could see that in this instance, Hilo Forte was much slower in its transition down the screen compared to the other eye drops uh, that were used today. So here we are, our final slide today. And I hope I have been able to achieve with you the learning outcomes which we stipulated about the pathophysiology of dry eye disease and how uh, the risk factors contribute towards this. How, as primary care physicians, we are able to manage dry eye disease in our practices and looking at all the available treatments that are currently available to us in order to do so. Also to select the most appropriate treatments and formulations for dry eye disease, ensuring that patients are at the center of our consultation and that they're brought into the actual decision-making process to ensure compliance and adherence. So a quick summary of our learnings uh, from this session. We know dry eyes are now a common problem and they present to us in our primary care practices uh, with individuals with ocular discomfort, watering eyes, and visual disturbances. We've noted that there are two main types of dry eyes, aqueous insufficiency and evaporative dry eyes. The diagnosis in primary care is based on the history and examination. And the tools such as use of the ocular surface disease index helps us to assess the severity and also allows us to monitor patient progress. It's also vital to consider 
whether systemic medications such as antidepressants and uh, blood pressure medication or preservatives in eye drops currently being used may be a contributing factor towards dry eyes. Looking at it from a patient's point of view and their perspective, how their lifestyle, smoking status, uh, if they are wearing lens, and also their work requirements, i.e. needing to work on the computer, may contribute and the impact it could have in our decision-making process for the treatment. And also, finally, looking at the hyaluronic acid preparations, uh, using a very uh, a patient centered approach, evidence based approach to ensure that not only are we providing the most cost effective, user friendly, and environmental treatment uh, available to that patient to ensure the patient's buy in and compliance towards that treatment and therapy. Thank you very much today, and I hope this is found to be beneficial to you in your work in primary care. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Sharmina Khan, and I work at Moorfields Eye Hospital. I thank Scope for inviting me to give this talk. I'm a cataract and lens specialist, and in it's a very it's very important in my clinics to optimise dry eye and blepharitis management to ensure accurate preoperative measurements of biometry and pentacam scans in order to avoid refractive surprise and also to prevent endophthalmitis which can occur rarely following cataract surgery but is triggered by the normal microbial flora found on the lid margins. My aim is to increase your awareness of the management options for dry eye and blepharitis and my specific objectives are to, for you to recognise dry eye disease and dry eye and blepharitis as two separate entities, um, to diagnose dry eye and differentiate between anterior and posterior blepharitis and also we'll be discussing the management options in the community and when to refer to the hospital eye service and what we would do in the hospital eye service in addition. The International Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society have described dry eye as a multifactorial condition that results in a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and it's accompanied by ocular symptoms, tear film instability, hyperosmolarity due to an increase in infl pro-inflammatory cytokines and these uh, cause inflammation and damage to the ocular surface can also be associated with neurosensory abnormalities. Quality of your life is severely affected in dry eye in some people and the significant drop in quality of life is on par with angina. Depression and anxiety is more prevalent and dry eye is linked to poor visual performance while driving and it also reduces productivity while at work. So who does it affect? Well, 44% of the population report dry eye symptoms. 47% of patients with dry eye disease are asymptomatic, however. And almost, one in, and almost 7 in 10 people show either signs or symptoms of dry eye disease. The tear film has the mucin layer produced by the goblet cells um, and, and an inner aqueous layer which nourishes and protects the cornea and then the lipid layer which is produced by the meibomian glands. The meibomian glands are found along the lid margin in the anterior lamella of the lid and lipid or meibom is produced by the acini which are then released into the central duct and blinking creates pressure which forces the meibom into the excretory duct and onto the eyelid margin and ocular surface and it prevents the evaporation of the aqueous layer. So it's an essential component of the tears. Dry eye symptoms can be variable they, and they can include light sensitivity, fluctuations in vision, burning or grittiness, sore or red eyes, contact lens discomfort, eyelids that are difficult to open in the mornings, watery eyes and then some people will notice that they have 
dandruff-like deposits around the eyelid or even a sticky eye sometimes too. Classifying dry eye disease, it's no longer classified as aqueous deficiency or evaporative dry eye. You can have a combination of both and this is what we describe now as meibomian gland dysfunction. Anterior blepharitis is a, common, a chronic condition and of the eyelid margins which become red and swollen and results in the build-up of bacteria, the normal ocular flora on the surface, so this is Staph aureus and Staph epidermidis. The symptoms are crusty, irritated, redness on the lid margin and the build-up of debris close to the root lash and then foreign body sensation. Mobomia gland dysfunction or posterior blepharitis is a chronic condition too and it occurs due to a reduction in lipid production again causing red eyes, grittiness, itchy and blurred vision. And if left untreated can result in calasian formation. So what are the questions that you should be asking when you suspect somebody with dry eye disease or dry eye disease and blepharitis? Burning, watery, itchy eyes, how long has it lasted? Do they have a dry mouth? Because they may have Sjögren's syndrome, which is dry eye, dry mouth, and rheumatoid arthritis. Was there a precipitating event? Was there a, did they have a, an acute red eye associated with a rash following the ingestion of a certain medication, as we find rarely sometimes in stevens johnson syndrome? Are they in pain? This would indicate um, a breach in the corneal epithelium. And does your vision clear when you blink? Is there redness or swelling? So let me discuss case one that might present to you in the community, a 54-year-old woman who's menopausal, complaining of gritty and sore eyes and feeling dry, and uses the laptop a lot at work, and now using two hourly teardrops, which do not alleviate her problem. She drives a car and she's a lawyer. She has a red, rims, a, a, a red rim to the lids and a diffuse conjunctival redness. Cornea is clear, pupils are normal. There's no preauricular lymphadenopathy might, that you might associate with adenovirus conjunctivitis. So how would you manage this? Well with daily hot compress with either face flannels or eye hot compress bags that you can put in the microwave that heat up and you can place them over the eye followed by firm pressure lid margin massage with a you know the clean fingertip. Find out which teardrops they're using, which ones seem to work for them or which ones haven't worked for them. Consider prescribing a higher concentration of sodium hyaluronate containing drops, so Hylofort, and an ointment at night, Hylonite, which used to be called Vitipos, which is a vitamin A derivative um, ointment. Start a three-month course of a tetracycline. Uh, um, employ omega-3 supplements. And in terms of dietary changes, you want to increase your omega-3 intake, reduce your omega-6 intake, because omega-6 is thought to be pro-inflammatory. And if these um, symptoms aren't reversible, then consider referring to an ophthalmologist. Case two is slightly different. A 34-year-old man with rosacea who has red, sore, sticky eyes and not using any drops at all. Um, and he... It drives a car and is a software developer, so spends a lot of time in front of a computer. And he also has red rim to the lids, a diffuse conjunctival injection, and a small lower lid sty. The rest of his examination is normal. So what do you do? The same again, hot compress, lid margin massage. But here you may start him off on a lower concentration sodium hyaluronate, given that he hasn't used eye drops before, for example, hyalotears, and consider a lipid replacement drop, given that he's got rosacea, so it'd be fair for you to assume that the meibomian glands would be fairly blocked. And an example of a lipid replacement drop is evotears, which has recently been launched by Scope. Offer omega-3 supplements and recommend dietary changes, a three-month course of doxycycline or limocycline. And again, if the symptoms don't improve, refer to an ophthalmologist. So what would an ophthalmologist do? Well, a careful history would involve including, um, excluding potentially blinding conditions like Sheridan syndrome and Stevens-Johnson syndrome, cicatrizing conditions, and importantly, even though it's rare, sebaceous cell carcinoma. So, you know, at this point, I'd like to highlight that blepharitis is never a unilateral condition. It's always 
bilateral. If you have a unit, if it's, it can be asymmetrical and appear unilateral, but look closely, it's always bilateral. And if you think this definitely is a unilateral um, blepharitis, then do refer into the hospital eye service so that we can exclude sebaceous cell carcinoma. Um, take a history on the eye drops used so far so that we can rationalise um, what to do next. We look at lid margin apposition against the globe and the architecture of the lid margin. So is the posterior migration of the grey line, um, a disorganised meibomian orifices, stenosis of the meibomian orifices, sometimes telangiectasia around the lid margin, again suggests chronicity. And then some ophthalmologists will have access to meibography as well as the slit lamp examination and Mabography can highlight focal loss of ducts as seen in blepharitis or a more diffuse loss which can be seen in chronic contact lens wear. An ophthalmologist will also assess the tear film height, tear film breakup time and test the wet and do a Schirmer's test which tests the wetting of a thin strip of chromatography like paper which by capillarity the tear film travels, travels along. Um, we'll also test corneal sensitivity using a tissue tip, assess the ocular surface with fluorescein using the Oxford's scoring system that looks at the distribution of epithelial defects in increasing severity and you know the thing is not to forget to also look at the superior limbal area because inflammation there may be associated with dysthyroid disease. A version of the upper and lower lids to look for papillae and follicles, papillae associated with ocular rosacea, scarring and symblepharon associated with cicatrizing conditions and then applying pressure along the lid margins to assess the degree of blockage and also to assess the degree of expressibility of the meibomian glands. Check intraocular pressure and optic discs because sometimes if people have been using steroids eye drops for a prolonged period they can have a associated rise in intraocular pressure. And if the symptoms are disproportionate to the signs then you may want to consider is this a neurogenic etiology. Things that we are not measuring well, however, are the blink rate. Often in busy clinics, there's a lack of time and also the resources. Lippy view is a device that measures blink rate. Hyperosmolarity isn't really measured in clinics. However, this is an indicator of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the tear film. Mabography, not everyone has access to the lippy scan, so not everyone can assess the degree, uh, the objective degree of um, meibomian gland dropout. Confocal microscopy, again, um, not, we don't all have access to that, and so there's, but it is useful in measuring a decrease in density in the nerve endings. And we don't measure local pro inflammatory mediators such as interleukin 6, TNF alpha, and VEGF, which propagate dry eye symptoms. Sometimes we miss the more subtler signs, for example, delayed fluorescein clearance on the slit lamp, again, which is suggestive of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Any persistent corneal pain after topical anesthesia, actually this is something that you could try in the community too, pop some anesthetic drop in without telling the patient that you're necessarily going to do so in this. If they're still feeling pain, then there is a central pain pathway defect. Um, transient punctate epitheliopathy often heals within 24 hours. So again, this is something we're not necessarily going to see, but the patient will describe pain in their history. Signs we may miss, conjunctiva cholesis is when you have a baggy um, conjunctiva, it sags over the lid margin. Superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis is a focal uh, injection superior, in the superior section of the limbus above the 12 o'clock position in the cornea and this is associated with dysthyroid conditions. Corneal basement, corneal epithelial basement membrane dystrophies are often missed, and then they can also cause rare, um, gritty eyes and sore eyes. Other things we might miss are toxicity to contact lens solutions, or non the excipients in non-preserved artificial teardrops, the excipients in glaucoma drops. Conjunctival scarring can be missed unless you avert the lids um, associated with 
um, sexualizing conditions. So if we move on to the management of dry eye disease and dry eye blepharitis, the Tearfill Ocular Surface Society recommend lid hygiene and heat being applied to the lid margins and lubricants. And they recommend preservative free eye drops have shown greater effectiveness than those with preserved that than those with preservatives in them. And the use of mechanical heating devices such as Lipiflow and Mibiflow, oral doxycycline and olinocycline, and the use of preservative free aqueous substitute drops and lipid replacement drops if it's maybe immune gland dysfunction. In the eye clinic we will also insert silicone punctal plugs that use topical steroids to dampen inflammation and if they need prolonged steroids use a cyclosporin as a steroid sparing agent. If they have Sjogren's syndrome then they'll need oral pilocarpin and again this is something that, be, that can be prescribed in the community. Acetylcysteine drops is um, an, an anti-mucolytic agent and finger prick autologous blood this is you know, this is now a really cost effective measure and I recommend watching this YouTube link by one of our consultants at Moorfields essentially you finger prick you, you, you do a finger prick like you do when you're testing your blood sugar and then with your and then raise your finger and place the drop of blood in, in into your inferior fornix and blink so that then provides the nourishment um, to he um, heal any punctate epitheliopathy and also address any dry eye symptoms. A address any coexisting pathology, so allergic eye disease, um, and address any complications that may arise from the above treatments. So treat intraocular pressure, treat any confluent epithelial defects that may be persistent rationalize the use of your drops. So I try and keep it really simple. I have unpreserved lubricants that I use and I don't use all of, you know, all of them in one go in a single patient, but rationalize what they've used before, what works and what doesn't work. And then use lubricants with a lipid replacement element to it, sustain balance, soothe, and the newly launched Evo Tears by Scope. So here's the big plug, the high-low range, and I've been using this for over seven years now. So I have experience using high-low tears, high-low forte, and high-low night, which used to be called Vitapol. So they are preservative-free, and they last six months, and it's actually a high-grade, um, high-quality hyalur sodium hyaluronate in it due to its high molecular weight in comparison to some other um, eye drops. It's suitable for use in contact lens wearers. Um, this multi-dose preservative free um, delivery system of artificial teardrops is a real game changer because in the past we used to use multi-unit doses which were really expensive and now we've overcome the cost of this and it really eases the use of, of single dose preparations and the sterility is maintained beyond 28 days. And, and the, in scope, the Hilo range has a comod dosage system which has a one way valve and that provides sterility for six months. TIA use a third generation ABAC which has a bifunctional membrane with antimicrobial properties that provides three months of sterility. So the treatment of aqueous deficiency is by the use of silicon removable punctal plugs over the collagen plugs which you can insert and then they dissolve. I, I've been advised by uh, my oculoplastic colleagues that actually this can cause stenosis of the nasolacrimal ducts and so I, I don't use those, I just use the silicon punctal plugs. Topical steroids are used to treat aqueous deficiency, topical cyclosporin as well, and oral pilocarpin as I've mentioned before. A therapeutic contact lens for you know can be used for a period if there's a persistent epithelial defect or longer term people may want to use scleral contact lens that apply that allows for pooling of tears behind the lens. And then again, the finger prick autologous blood really really works in this situation too. Maximal treatment of meibomian gland disease is required, so patient education, 
by demonstrating lid hygiene using either patient information leaflets or referring them to a YouTube video. Um, buying eye compresses which can be put into the microwave to heat up to an adequate temperature. Um, use of systemic tetracyclines um, and also if there is papillae under the tarsal that under the tarsal conjunctiva then this is really suggestive of ocularization so this is when topical steroids is appropriate or cyclosporin. Um, azithromycin is also useful in this situation too as well as, well as omega-3 supplements. Recent research has suggests that vitamin D deficiency associated with dry eye disease and commonly so in Asians in the UK. So again, this is something that we could employ in the community. Topical Avastin um, has been studied and shown at this reduced strength to reduce the ocular surface disease index scores at 12 weeks. So this is promising. And there are other drops, TPO3, which paralyzes demodex mites in demodex blepharitis, and NRO1, which is used for corneal pain masquerading as dry eye. These, aren't wide, these drops aren't widespread use yet, then, but um, let's, see, let's see if they um, infiltrate into our ophthalmology clinics. The Lipiscan and Lipiflow um, systems have been reviewed by NICE and they've been and they advise that you know, this is clinically effective, however not cost effective to use in the NHS simply because these devices um, are disposable and have to, and can only be used once per patient. Um, but they heat up the lid margin to 42 degrees and melt any blocked meibomian glands, just like melting butter in a pan, and improve the flow of oils through the meibomian ducts. The lid biofilm is produced by the ocular flora, which causes exogenous inflammatory lid disease. And it's important that this is removed mechanically with either lid wipes or a device called the Blefex, which has a rotating tip that's used along the lash line. Um, and this can significantly improve symptoms. This is useful for patients who can't manage to do their own lid hygiene and for example patients with arthritis who find it tricky to do the lid margin massage or some people who are say for example um, very long-sighted and when looking in the mirror doing nearsighted activities they're too blurred to see their lid margin clearly. Modifying behaviour and the environment so reducing the prolonged contact lens where remembering to blink during prolonged computer or the use of VDU screens, um, changing the humidity in your environment if you can, considering what cosmetics you're using, possibly smoking also has a dry eye effect, and diets, dietary effects. So, you know, you want to increase your omega-3 and reduce your omega-6. Omega-3 is um, anti-inflammatory, omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. Now blinking matters, as we know, it's compromised in people with Parkinson's disease or Down syndrome, as well as contact lens wearers and those who work for prolonged periods in front of a VDU screen. And so there's this app called iBlink, which you can install into your laptop, and it, tell, it reminds you when to blink, if you're not blinking enough. So the learning points I'd like to share with you is, please remember that blepharitis and dry eye is always bilateral even if it's asymmetrical you know I've been very surprised by some high streets who offer um, blepharitis treatments with either Mibiflow or Lipiflow and offer it just in one eye because it's cheaper than having to pay for both eyes for the patient but really that's unethical if you genuinely think somebody has a unilateral blepharitis think of sebaceous cell carcinoma because it may be masquerading and they should be referred in and I like this heat cleanse and hydrate mantra, um, heat with either a flannel or um, a, face, uh, a face mask that can be heated up in the microwave or oven, or have lipoflow or mibiflow treatment, cleanse using a wipe or blefex, and then hydrate with preservative-free artificial tears. Use systemic tetracycline, omega-3 supplements and vitamin D, 
and remember conscious blinking so pause and stop to blink and if these of the problems are not reversible then please rever refer into the hospitalized service thank you for listening and if you have any questions do email or phone in Okay, I just want to say thank you everyone for joining this scope sponsored webinar. We're now going to put a poll on the screen just for some feedback. There's only three questions on there and we'd appreciate if you could answer those. So I'll put that on the screen now. Okay, fantastic. So for the last slide. So if anyone has any additional queries or any interest in further ophthalmology educational meetings or like any high-low samples, there is two email addresses on the screen. There's Cash Chohan. Now Cash, she covers North London, Hertfordshire and Essex. If you are in that geographical area and would like any samples or any further information, please reach out to her. Same goes to Trevor Lake. Same, he is in South London and he covers the southeast of the UK. Again, if you'd like any samples, any further information, please drop him an email. If, however, you fall outside of those geographical zones, drop either one of those of the email and they will be able to point you to your relevant local scope business develop development manager. We've also got more educational talks coming up in the near future. So in the bottom right, we have our link to our scope education hub. We will also be putting this content up there as well within the next week. So if anyone has missed this, or if anyone would like to share it with their colleagues, please send them to our Scope Education Hub. Wish you all a great evening and enjoy the rest of your weeks. Thank you so much for attending.